Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 480, the second edition on Friday. I'm Gavin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 25th of January, the feast of the wonderful and blessed Apostle St. Paul. Okay, for those of you who are watching the show, you're like, wait a minute. Gavin, he's all pixelated and he looks like he's coming not from his castle in France, not from his chapel in his, his shed. Where are you right now, Gavin? Well, I'm a few miles south of Corinth. Uh, I'm in Greece on an island and I'm at a, an ecumenical conference with Roman Catholics uh, and Greek Orthodox and Anglicans. Bishop Rhea is here with me. That's great. Uh, and he, he, he and I have been asked to speak as Anglicans. Uh, in the week of prayer for Christian unity, and we're having the most wonderful and, and, and powerful ecumenical conference in the spirit. That's good. That's very good. So before we start, I need to do the like the show. Yeah, I, and I know a lot of you like the show. Some of you have no choice but to watch it because you're paid to watch it. I know some p people at the uh, the church house have to watch the show because they have to keep up what's going on. I'm sorry. But like it anyway. Just click the like button. Share the show with your friends, uh, your bishops, your clergy, your lay people. Um, and even if you don't like the show or you're afraid to admit you watch the show, just share it. Comment. We have been getting lots of comments in the YouTube section. Just go to our YouTube channel, click on the video you want to comment on, and join the conversation. A lot of fun goes on there. Uh, and anything else? Oh, donate. If you want to donate, go to the Anglican.inc uh, donate page and uh, give us some money to help with our travels and equipment and future. Um, let's talk a little bit about Anglican Inc. I saw some nice stories there yesterday. Let me just move on over here and see if there's something you want to talk about. Um, let's see. Do you know what a Bryden is? Well, a, a Bryden in this case is a Timothy Bryden, <laughs> ah, and it's yes. a, and it's a report into into poor George Bell and the character assassination okay. unleashed against him. So, by, let, by let, a, we, before we get into that, we need to back up. George Bell is before color photography. George Bell is, you know, back in the mid-century, a wonderful bishop from the Church of England. Um, Throughout his ministry, no complaints, no accusations, um, no nothing, uh, until uh, a couple decades after his death, uh, a few rumors started about him saying that uh, he uh, had uh, sexual relations with some people, and this just kind of kept in the rumor mill, kept in the rumor mill, and boom, it becomes an investigation. Uh, and things go downhill from there. And I thought we could talk now. Uh, I don't. I, I hope this is over. I hope the Bryden report is the final nail in the coffin of our investigation into no, George no, Bell. No. no, Kevin, it should not be over because Bell hasn't been cleared yet. Okay, so this doesn't no, clear him. No, I mean, <sighs> I mean, yes, of course it clears him. No, the report clears him. But yes. the Archbishop of Canterbury won't clear. No, so let's let's talk about that. So uh, there was investigations. There's police reports. There's the pronouncements from Lambeth that there's just it's just too serious not to look into and investigate further. And basically, for the last two and a half years, the reputation of George Bell has been uh, muddled beyond belief uh, for a man who's dead and can't speak for himself. Uh, so bring us up to speed on what this report says, Gavin. Um, just to add slightly to the background, sure. uh, a, wom a woman called Carol, that's not her real name, complained that when she was a child, she was invited into the bishop's palace, she believed, and was sexually assaulted by the bishop. And then 70 years later, she, she talks about it. So there are a number of issues, really. And the first one is, how reliable is memory, seven, 70 years later? The next one is, was it the Bishop's Palace and was it George Bell? There are a lot of people who looked formidably clerical in the clothes in, uh, uh, in the uh, 70 years ago. So there's no doubt at all that Carol is upset and she has these difficult memories and, uh, and wants to hold the church accountable for them. And that's quite right. It is quite right. In fact, I, I want to interrupt you here. 
the Roman Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, the Methodist Church, the Church of England have been devastated by sexual sin within the clergy realms. There's no denying that. And so if there's an accusation, it should be taken seriously. Very much so. The, right. the problem was that the process by which the Church of England listened to Carol was, was so flawed, it's beyond a joke. Uh, and eventually, two things happened. One is uh, that the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishop of Chichester went public on the accusations on the grounds they thought they were serious. Now, one of the things they said was, it wasn't just Carol, there was other stuff, but they wouldn't tell us what the other stuff was. They, they, but they said, if you knew what the other stuff was, you, you'd know why we're throwing bells to the sure. wolves. A lot of people said, but, but this isn't the right way of handling it. Your, your process has been bad, your conclusion has been awful. Uh, you really cannot destroy someone's reputation posthumously, and you certainly can't do it in these circumstances. So um, then Lord Carlyle's report came out and said it had been handled badly, and he gave every indication that he had great difficulties with the conclusion that Bell had been a paedophile. But everything was in the terms of reference. So now the next thing happens is a man called Timothy Bryden is also asked to do another report, on the other stuff that they said, if we had known about, we'd understand why they had to take that action. So Brighton has looked at these other allegations and exposed them for what they are. They are, they are, they are, they are full of contradictions, they're unsubstantiated, they're off the wall, they're from another planet, uh, and every one of them falls away. And they engage in some degree of what Brighton called cross-contamination, co copycatting. So the fact is that although we were told by the safeguarding people in the Church of England that if we had only known what these secret cases were, we would have joined them in their condemnation. We now do know, thanks to Timothy Bryden, and we know that they were not only unsubstantial, but actually horrible. I mean, it's really horrible that these other additional accusations could emerge in the in the unpleasant fantasy life of long-term memories because they, they really don't stack up i mean <clears throat> i'll give you an example it's it's not a very pleasant one but you will see why um so in one of them a man said his mother worked in the palace and one day his mother who was a cleaner answered the telephone the bishop wasn't there so she went to the garage to look for the bishop and there she saw the bishop engaging in energetic sex with a man across the bonnet of a rolls royce now there are a number of problems. First of all, the date he gave, the, first of all, the date he gave, the bishop had been dead 10 years. So uh -huh. that's not good. So they told him that, and then he changed the date. Uh, and then they asked what his mother had done. And the fact is, in those days, cleaners didn't answer the telephone. You had to be, you had to be very privileged in English society to answer the telephone in the bishop's palace. And it was done by his chaplain or by his secretary, uh, not by a cleaner. But just imagine a cleaner had done it. Where would she look for the bishop? Um, in those days, again, bits of the palace were like little empires. The garage was the empire of the chauffeur. The uh, uh, people <laughs> just think Downton Abbey. Okay. Yeah, think, think Downton Abbey. Right, Have, just... you, you wouldn't go looking for Lord whatever his name was in the garage because that was where the chauffeur was. And... And if you did go into the garage, you wouldn't have found a Rolls Royce. You would have found a black car, but it wasn't a Rolls Royce. And worse than that, the new date that they gave, the poor bishop was about 71 or 72 and not in very good health. Now, whatever he might, I, I won't be tasteless enough yeah, to yeah, go. No, that's that. fine. Uh, the conclusion was that, that even if he had been that way inclined and it wasn't just little girls on his knee, uh, but it was a gay mafia in his garage on a Saturday afternoon. He, he, he was too old and ill. The whole thing stinks. It's horrible. It's really upsetting. And the idea that this could have been entertained as a serious corroborative allegation when it was uh, the hearsay of, of something uh, utterly unsustainable really looks bad. Now, when you look at the others two, they're, not, they're no better. So Bryden has looked at them all and said, these don't stack up. You, you, you. A moment's investigation would have told you you could not have used these as any kind of corroboration for Carol. Now, the Carol thing matters because in, uh, in the terms of reference Bryden was given, he wanted to look at Carol. And in particular, he wanted to use the test in Lord Carlyle's reports that memory, 70 years after the event, is a very problematic thing. It's, it's animated. Memories grow and they die. They don't stay still like, like photographs. 
uh, and for an uncorroborated memory, seventy years old, you 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 wouldn't you wouldn't weigh anything on it. But the Church of England chose to to destroy Bell's reputation, and the problem with that is twofold. One is they shouldn't have done it, but the other thing is, as people said, what if Justin Welby? What if one day in seventy years' time, a lady says, "I went into Justin Welby's palace and he assaulted me, and I want you to believe me. I'm very upset." Would they then, on that? evidence throw his reputation as the world. You, you know, whatever will be false, you really hope not. No, you, uh, you, so you, the, the problem is we're going with guilty, uh, not innocent until proven guilty, but guilty until yeah. proven guilty. It's the wrong uh, side of the coin you're looking at in terms of this type of thing. You're going to end up in slander. You're going to end up in libel, um, except the person's dead and they can't do a thing about it. There's nothing George Bell can do to defend himself, and there's your problem. We had, you know, if somebody had written in a diary, just, if somebody had written in their diary seven years ago that this happened, that has a lot more weight than a memory of a person um, who who's try, trying to recount something that happened that long ago. So the, the Brighton report comes out. We have apologies now. We have an official policy from the Bishop of Churcher, and we have a, an official policy from uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. Um, obviously, these guys know how to really apologize. <laughs> these apologies are dreadful. But the one that's not dreadful is, mm -hmm. is the Bishop of Christmas. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not his greatest fan uh, that, that, that we have history. No. Um, but, but nonetheless, his apology is quite good, except for the very end when, when he spoils it. But the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Safeguarding Committees are both, are both seriously bad. The Safeguarding Committee uses this terrible phrase, we will learn lessons, or we have learned lessons, which everyone knows means nothing at all. And the Archbishop simply can't let Bell go. He's so fixated by victim culture he said that he says, okay, so even though the report, this report says that we were wrong to give any weight to these extra corroborative things, and even though Carlyle's report says we were wrong to, to rely on 70-year-old's memories, and even though it's absolutely true that George Bell is one of the most significant holy and religious figures in the 20th century, nonetheless, You've got to take the victim so seriously that, well, that what? Bell is still not innocent as far as the Archbishop is concerned. Well, yeah, and but, so I, need to inter I need to interrupt you here. We learned last oh. week that um, the Archbishop of Canterbury has special baptism in the Holy Spirit and has oh, special no. spiritual oh, discernment. No. And I think you need to uh, follow his conclusions a little more closely because in the morning he speaks in tongues and at a certain point during the day, obviously, he has more discernment in these areas than you or I. And I, I don't know how you can, you can compete with that, Gavin. Well, I just want to say one thing, Kevin. Mm -hmm. the, um, it's, it's, it's clear that the PR machine at Lambeth was pitching for evangelical charismatic support. Sure, from yeah. Yeah. That's that, was, that was what this was all about. And so, <laughs> which is why this, 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 this tasteless and spiritually bombastic uh, slipping in of glossolalia into the conversation was there and, and shouldn't have been. The, I was quite interested in the prophecies because uh, since I left the Church of England, and, and I'm, I'm given to a little bit of charismania myself, um, people have been sending me prophecies and from all over the place. I'm going to spell it out. Uh, of course, it's partly self-selective. Of course, they would send these to me, wouldn't they? Although yeah. you, you'd think that if people, if the Lord had been saying... Gavin, the Church of England is going to repent. You've made a mistake. You should repent. Well, I'd be happy to get them. I really, I really would. Um, but in fact, these prophecies have all of them. The ones that have been sent to me said, the Lord has been warning the Church of England for a very long time. He's removing the lapstand. Step back. Now, I don't know if they're true. I'm moved by the fact there are many of them. And uh, one has to take them seriously. What I found very difficult was the Archbishop saying, I get prophecies with my morning post, and some I like and some I don't like. And I thought, well, all right, tell us what the criteria are. Yeah, right. we'd, we'd, we'd like to hear. Um, <laughs> well, any prophecy that says a bishop has conducted himself in sexual sin is obviously a real prophecy. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> so I, I, I ha I'm, I'm sorry. I, am, I find the whole thing really very difficult. And then because the, the, the next thing that happened was he gave... He gave an interview to the Spectator, 
where um, you may have heard, he was asked whether he minded that 10% uh, of the Roman Catholic priests in Great Britain are, are previous Anglicans, his clergy. And he was asked, well, does it matter, Archbishop, that you've lost so many clergy, they now, they now figure as 10% of the Roman Catholic clergy in the country? Oh, not at all, said Welby. Uh, as, if, as if denominations were a kind of lifestyle choice. Now, he conducted the interview in Cranmer's study. He uh, did not. Remember what no way. <laughs> he was in Cranmer's study. And, and, you know, we remember Cranmer because he was burnt by Queen Mary. And, and, and he was so upset at having recanted that he stretched out the hand with which he signed the recantation to let it be burnt first because truth mattered <laughs> and and you know if the roman catholics are, are now the roman catholics today are not the same as they were in the in the 16th century they're different but nonetheless there are truth claims which divide the churches and they matter enormously um so, uh, and, yeah, but he treated them as though they, they didn't matter in the slightest there are parts of the anglican communion that find rome to be heretical it's, a, it, 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 it's I'm giving you the truth. I'm not telling you what I think. I'm just saying that, you know, a large portion, you know, through the 39 articles, through the church history, through the, just the violent clashes we've had between the Church of England um, and the Roman Catholic Church over the last 400 years, I understand these. And I, I see the arguments and I see the scripture and I see the 39 articles to have the leader of the Anglican communion, the Archbishop of Canterbury say, if you want to be Roman, there's no big deal. I find that very disheartening. However, he's created an environment where uh, going after Rome is probably a solution to the fraught you find in the Church of England. Well, that's one of the reasons why, why people have gone there, because they have looked for a degree of, of ethical and spiritual integrity, mm -hmm. which they don't find in the smorgasbord relativism of a, of, of a secular, enculturated Church of England. I mean, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's not the way, um, do whatever you feel like or whatever appeals to you today and the life. I mean, it, of course, there are, truth is something we have to work very hard to get at. But for goodness sake, it, it matters so much that Christians have given their lives. The martyrs gave their lives for the truth. How is it possible that a man can inherit the office in which one of his predecessors was martyred for the truth and say, yeah, well, it's, it's just a matter of what turns you on at this particular point in your spiritual journey. It, it's just it's not acceptable. Okay. <laughs> so to be clear, the Bride Report pretty much exonerates George Bell uh, completely says you know every accusation has been thoroughly investigated we've conducted you know test by test by test we find nothing the bishop uh, chichester says yep I, I agree i'm sorry archbishop welby says yeah i agree i'm sorry but and that's big kind but. of where we find ourselves yeah big mm -hmm. uh, uh, such a big but that you have to wonder if he's sorry yeah hmm Oh boy! So, uh, is there something else we were going to talk about? Uh, da, 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 da. Well, it is. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I think we got everything. You see, you're yeah, at the conference. We, we, we've done everything exciting. Yeah, we did everything. <laughs> we done everything we could do to possibly make uh, <clears throat> Church House and Archbishop Canterbury and Lambeth a little upset with us and inform the Anglican communion about to the transparency of what's really going on uh, whilst recording from the middle of nowhere, Greece. Congratulations well, on whilst, that. Whilst, whilst, on the feast of St. Paul. Yes. <laughs> near where St. Paul brought the gospel. Oh, so because if you, if you, first of all, if you read St. Paul, you discover that, first of all, if you do have tongues, A, you don't talk about it, and B, it doesn't matter very much. What really matters are some of the more serious gifts of the Spirit and 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 love mm -hmm. uh, and second if you read st paul you realize that he got beaten up flogged and finally executed because he would not compromise on the truth of the gospel and that's an example that we would like to have set by our clergy uh, and by our bishops and our archbishops mm -hmm. um, so dear, god bless dear st paul and um, just don't look now dear brother <laughs> I pray one day that the, the press would come down on Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, for being too religious, too orthodox, 
too forthright because he speaks the gospel too much and because he loves Jesus too much. That is my prayer. Well, the wonderful thing about Christianity, uh, and it applies, to, it applies to me and I've benefited greatly from it, is that the opportunity to repent is endless. The door is always open to come back. It's never too late. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashton, and you've been listening to the pixelated episode, Anglican Unscripted 480. <laughs> We're pixelated, but you still look better than I do. I don't know how this works. It's just, it's it's the craziness of technology. Pure as driven snow is pure as driven snow. You can't beat it. Yeah.